from Washington, the McLaughlin Group, the American original. For over three decades, the sharpest minds, best sources, hardest talk. Issue one, Benghazi cover up. Speaker of the House, John Boehner, named Republican Representative Trey Gowdy to chair a House Select Committee on Benghazi. On September 11, 2012, four Americans, Ambassador Christopher Stevens, Foreign Service Officer Sean Smith, and Glenn Doherty and Tyrone Woods, on contract to the CIA, were slain in a coordinated assault on the U.S. consulate and a CIA annex in Benghazi, Libya. Ambassador Stevens is one of only seven U.S. ambassadors to die in the line of duty in the nation's 240-year history. I'm not telling you how to do your job, but I'm going to ask you some questions, and if you can't answer these questions, then I'll leave you to draw whatever conclusion you want to draw about whether or not the media has provided sufficient oversight. Can you tell me why Chris Stevens was in Benghazi? the night that he was killed. Do you know? Do you know why requests for additional security were denied? Do you know why an ambassador asking for more security days and weeks before he was murdered and those requests went unheeded? Do you know the answer to why those requests went unheeded? Do you know why no assets were deployed during the siege? Do you know whether the president called any of our allies and said, can you help? We have men under attack. Can you answer that? Do any of you know why Susan Rice was picked? The Secretary of State did not go. She says she doesn't like Sunday talk shows. That's the only media venue she does not like, if that's true. Why was Susan Rice on the five Sunday talk shows? Do you know the origin? of this mythology, that it was spawned as a spontaneous reaction to a video. Do you know where that started? Do you know how we got from no evidence of that to that being the official position of the administration? In conclusion, Congress is supposed to provide oversight. The voters are supposed to provide oversight. And you were supposed to provide oversight. That's why you have special liberties, and that's why you have special protections. Uh, I am not surprised that the President of the United States called this a phony scandal. I'm not surprised that Secretary Clinton asked, what difference does it make? I'm not even surprised that Jay Carney said Benghazi happened a long time ago. I'm just surprised at how many people bought it. Question. What do you make of that series of questions? That was just put to I you. thought that was extraordinarily effective, John. I had not seen that before. And that is exactly what this committee's got to do. No sound bites, but ask these tough questions and get answers. Why were these guys requests for defense of the compound answered? Why was no help even offered or sent in an all night attack? Why was the lies all concocted on the very night of the attack in this whole cover-up story. Why did it take months now, even after Susan Rice and the President of the United States put out this cock and bull story for the Ben Rhodes memo to surface because of Judicial Watch and then raise this thing to a congressional investigation? If the Congress, and I've got my concerns about how well they'll do it, if they do it as well as Trey Gowdy did what he just did, if they answer questions like that, this could really benefit the country about a squalid government dereliction of duty and a squalid cover-up to follow. Uh, Trey Gowdy has already referred to this investigation as a trial and called the administration the defendants. Uh, this is a political witch hunt. He knows the answer to those questions. There have been two congressional investigations. There's been a three-month investigation by the New York Times. Nobody has come up with malicious wrongdoing on the part of the administration. The first question he asked, why was Ambassador Stevens there? This was not a diplomatic outpost. This was a CIA outpost. And uh, Ambassador Stevens was known as, a, as an assertive ambassador who actually didn't pay enough attention to his own personal uh, safety. He didn't like what was going on in that count consulate. They were detaining people. They were interrogating people. And he was going there to 
basically confront what was going on. This was a CIA operation, which is why there was so much confusion about how to respond in the hours immediately after. And if uh, Mr. Gowdy wants to turn this into a political exercise, he's playing with the national mm -hmm. security of the United States, and it's, they're already fundraising on it, the Republicans are. It's a pretty shameless exercise. You know, both sides fundraise off stuff like this all the time. Both sides are guilty of that. Aside from that, I don't think we have answers about what happened there, and we certainly don't have answers about how the White House responded. They've given one answer. We see other answers by these Judicial Watch emails that they were politicizing things. They were worried about the president's reelection and not being straight with the American people about what happened, and that is why we've now risen to this level of the select committee. I think it's really great that you played that whole string of Trey Gowdy uh, because it gives people an idea of why he was picked to head this committee. Regardless of whether you think it's a good idea or a bad mm. idea, they thought he was the most effective person based on the fact that he is a former prosecutor. He was a very successful prosecutor in South Carolina, and they think he can do the best job, you know, ferreting out the answers to these questions. Be they political or not, there are important answers that we don't have. And, and uh, just what you were talking about now about the CIA, I think a lot of people out there don't realize that. I think there are a lot of There's questions. There's a reason about, they don't. What, it's the but, CIA. Well, <laughs> what, what were they doing there? I mm. think people have a right to know. The first ambassador killed uh, since 1979, mm -hmm. and there's still questions about what happened. Boehner, you know Boehner. Oh, yes. Boehner thinks mm -hmm. the White House has been holding out on Congress. Under subpoena last week, the White House disclosed 41 documents it had withheld from congressional investigators. At least one of these, an email from Ben Rose on the NSC, directly contradicts what congressional investigators were told. You following me on yeah. that? So this is why we are going through this investigation, which she has described as kind of a re a, a, an excessive, over-the-top, uh, additional investigation of that which has already been investigated. But well, that investigation that took place was woefully deficient be because of a variety of reasons that, that Boehner feels, and I think many people feel have not been addressed when four of our Americans, including an ambassador, were murdered. Yes, and I think what triggered that as well was the discovery of uh, memos that had not previously been made public. Nevertheless, having said that, I think it is appropriate to have this kind of thing under those circumstances. I, I would also say this. Uh, since Hillary Clinton was the Secretary of State at that point, I suspect that if she wasn't running for the presidency, or they didn't think she was, this wouldn't have nearly the kind of energy. So we have to be very careful not to give this uh, a, a sort of a taint that uh, does not involve politics, because I think that's a part of what's involved here, and that, that's the sad part of this. By the way, Mort, Judicial, Mort right. Judicial Mort, Watch was the one that has arranged. Judicial Watch did it, but Mort is exactly right. This thing has really <laughs> got to be done well. It's got to be tough questions and all the rest. But let me say this, Alan. I mean, what I just heard from you is, what in heaven's name, where is the national media? They're all over Watergate, every little aspect of it. Now the New York Times and all these major media institutions say, what are we doing? Move on. Nothing to see here. What is going on? What every, happened to the mainstream media? Every media organization has investigated this to death. This uh -huh. animates the right wing of the Republican Party. And I would like to point out that Ambassador Stevens was not murdered. He died of smoke inhalation in the safe room in oh, that CIA installation. I don't think that's, installation. Been, I don't think that's, that's the fact, but it Eleanor. changes that. I think that is no. I think I've heard a drastically different story well, from people who are also in the know about that. So I don't. I don't think. I don't think it was a terrorist attack, Eleanor. He was murdered in yeah. a terrorist attack. It was an opportunistic attack. terrorist attack that opportunistic. Uh, grew, opportunistic That's the question. that grew out mm -hmm. of that video. The video uh, there had were, nothing there to were, do with it. The there were uh, there were <laughs> demonstrations across there were, the world not in because Benghazi. of that. Not in mm. Benghazi. There was no video still related to it at all. Uh, still we, uh, still opportunistic and it's still a CIA and if you're going to put people on trial, we should put David Petraeus on trial, well, bring him not in, Hillary he, Clinton. He should testify too. Please, uh, uh, please nobody's going to answer well. those please subpoenas. Please relinquish. We're going to be returning to this subject, I'm sure. <laughs> repeatedly over the next six months. I hope not. Exit John. question. <laughs> Is the Benghazi scandal waxing or waning? Pat Buchanan. It's clearly waxing because of the Ben Rhodes memo. It's Hello. clearly waning because Obamacare is doing better and the Republicans need to run on something and this is what gets their base excited. Uh, Susan. It's just getting fired up. Boy, I agree. It's, it's not waning. It's certainly waxing. 
uh, of waxing indeed. Don't forget the McLaughlin Group has its own website and you can watch this program or earlier programs on the web at any time from anywhere in the world, McLaughlin.com. What could be easy? Huh? <laughs> Issue two, Putin's volt Foss. Russian President Putin, Vladimir Putin, Putin did an about Putin, face in Indian Ukraine Putin. this week after months of escalating tensions and bloodshed. Following a meeting with the president of Switzerland, Didier Burkhalter, in Moscow, Putin called for a halt in a separatist referendum scheduled for May 11 and tacitly endorsed Kiev's planned May 25 presidential election. Burkhalter is also chairman of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE. He persuaded Putin that the OSCE will pressure okay. Ukraine to end its military push in eastern Ukraine and engage secessionist leaders in negotiations over the country's future. In turn, Putin claimed to withdraw Russian troops from Ukraine's border. But White House officials dispute any such withdrawal has occurred. Why the both pass? The explanation may lie in recent polls taken across Ukraine by the respected Pew Research Center. 77% of Ukrainians want to keep their country united. Only 14% want to allow secession. 9% don't know. When only Eastern Ukrainians are polled, 70% say they want unity. Only 18% would permit secession. And 13% don't know. If only Ukraine's Russian speakers are polled, 58% want unity, 27% would allow secession, and 15% don't know. So all told, secession loses big. These results persuaded Putin that separatist referenda, if free and fair, would backfire on Russia. Secessionist leaders in eastern Ukraine ignored Putin's call to halt the referendum and said they would go forward with the balloting on this Sunday. Question, is Vladimir Putin's reversal on Ukraine credible, or is it a ploy? I ask you, Pat. I think it's both, John. I think it's credible because I don't think Vladimir Putin wants to annex eastern Ukraine. That would be an economic disaster for his country because of the sanctions. It would be a political disaster because western Ukraine would be lost forever, and people would be talking about bringing western Ukraine into NATO. He's got to Crimea. I think what Putin wants to do is essentially down the road, and I think it's not necessarily not in our interest, he wants to Finlandize Ukraine, make it neutral, not in NATO, decentralize the government so that eastern Ukraine can have its own self-expression, and make it politically and economically open both to the European Union and to Russia. And it seems to me that is the best solution for both sides. Many in Kiev won't like it. The militants in eastern Ukraine won't like it. But I think it would be best for the United States and for Russia. I, I think that's, that's the deal that uh, the administration is, is pushing. And Henry Kissinger has written about the Finlandization of right. Ukraine, which is open to both sides. Uh, NATO is not going to accept Ukraine. And mm -hmm. I, if, if Ukraine were in a NATO, we'd be in a terrible situation uh, today. So I think... Well, the leaders of the West and the East both want to walk away from this confrontation. And we all assume that Putin is so shrewd and he knows exactly what he's doing. I think mm -hmm. he's operating by the seat of his pants here. here. And he's really, he's really looking for an off-ramp here. I, I agree with what both you're saying, but I, I think that you, I wonder if you're being a little bit too optimistic, thinking that these are what is Putin's plan. I mean, he's such an ambitious man and he clearly has an appetite for, you know, regaining some of the territory lost when the Soviet, the Soviet Union fell mm -hmm. apart. I mean, is he really going to just, this, this sounds like such a benign plan, or I think yeah. he's just kind of trying but to pull the wool over really his eyes Does he really want to annex East Ukraine? But, but, let, let me just go to another issue. He Putin, wrestles Putin's, lions pop, <laughs> Putin's popularity, <laughs> Putin's popularity within his own country had dropped significantly. Right. Right. When this <laughs> happened, I'm serious, right. when, when this happened, his popularity yeah. soared. Yeah. There is a great impulse within the Soviet Union to be once again this kind of transnational power. And I think he feeds to that. I'm not saying it's a perfect solution to his problems, mm -hmm. but there's no doubt but it transformed his public opinion. And you never want to underestimate right. that, that sort yeah. of motivation but in a politician. Like Somebody else appeared on the scene. Who was that? 
on on this scene or for the, the, the scene issue of Ukraine? The You're talking Switzerland? the fellow from Switzerland? Well, right, Switzerland. The president of Switzerland. <laughs> well, he yeah. was and there. That, and he also has another title. He's head of the OSCC. OSCC, right. Organization for Security and Cooperation right. in Europe. I think that is... Is that way, possible that yep. Putin has some of his own you money? Also, There's no, 70 billion? No, I think in, the, guy, the, the guy could send him a message, no, no. look, you're going to be in very tough trouble economically with sanctions. At the same time, it offers Putin somebody to talk to who is not a so-called adversary. Right. I agree. Putin's at 82 percent. But you've got to look down the road. If you grab eastern Ukraine, what, you, what do you get? Yeah. You've got these provinces right. that, are, that are very destitute, and then you've got the whole world against you. And so I think Putin is a very smart yeah. guy. I agree that he reacted reactively when he lost Ukraine he grabbed Crimea and said we'll hold our naval base now he's out there and saying I, mean, I don't think I want to go any further he had different reasons the for Crimea right, right. I mean he right. had strategic got the naval base yeah. naval what about base the OSCE and the access to the Mediterranean well the OSCE he's the guy that got him out I think <laughs> there were eight OSCE guys locked up four of them Germans Merkel called him and somehow well, they were let go in eastern Ukraine well the Swiss connection also could have something to do with Mr. Putin's personal that's what I've already just said. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. How are my accounts uh, going? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so we've hit pay dirt there. Yeah, that's but right. I don't, that's I don't right. think that's it. I think this no, man no, made, no, it, made a convincing anger. case to him. This is the best yeah. way for you to handle the, this new extension right. of your mm -hmm. empire, which you, yes. you know, A, yeah. B, C, let, D, let, and E. Let me just make a comment about Putin's fortune, which is estimated to be no less than $50 billion and closer to $70 billion. Right. At that point, it doesn't make a difference whether there's a billion up man or a billion down. You know, beyond, he wants to preserve Buffett. his power and his place more than anything else. Oh. And I think this no, in part he, was what this was I about. think he was oh, impressed yeah. with this is very careful footing that you must exercise right. now. I agree with and that. And slow the process down. And he I, may have changed his mind. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, issue three, student loan blues. With interest rates low, homeowners have been refinancing their mortgages. But the federal government does not let people holding student loans refinance down to the low interest rates available. This bill would say, yes, they can refinance. Democratic Senator Elizabeth Warren introduced her Bank on Students' Emergency Loan Refinancing Act this week, co-sponsored by 23 Senate Democrats, including a bevy of Democratic incumbents up for re-election come November. Warren's bill would allow the 40 million Americans with student loans to refinance to the low 3.86% rate available to new borrowers. Current U.S. student loan indebtedness stands at $1.2 trillion, higher than overall consumer credit card debt. The burgeoning debt load is driven by historically high college tuition costs as well as looser lending standards, which permit students to use loan funds for living expenses and foreign vacation travel to exotic locales like Thailand and Indonesia, not to mention spring break in Cancun. The average student graduates college today with $29,000 in student loan debt. Warren's legislation would cost taxpayers $50 billion a sum she proposes to make up by imposing a surtax on people whose incomes exceed $1 million annually, the so-called Buffett Rule Warren Tax, first proposed by billionaire investor Warren Buffett. Here's Senator Warren's new book, A Fighting Chance, Elizabeth Warren, just came out, um, just in advance of Hillary's book, I guess. Hmm? I think so. Does that say anything? I think Hillary's book will sell more copies. That they can put Hillary's book yeah. right on top of that book. When <laughs> Some very <laughs> uh, fetching pictures inside. Yeah. Uh, she's the real deal. She's the real deal, and she comes Wait. from uh, the lower from Cherokee Nation. She comes from the <laughs> lower. The real deal. Well, she comes from the lower middle class. <laughs> she was told from the time she was a child that Are she sure? was inherit. She inherited uh, some Cherokee blood. If that's what you want to giggle about. <laughs> Uh, she she, 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 America, she is the scourge of American banks because, yeah. uh, look, anybody who's okay. sitting on a 6% interest loan of any kind mm. feels that they should have the right to renegotiate. And uh, yeah. she's putting forward the fact that people saddled with student debt should be able to do this. It's terrific public policy. It'll 
never get 60 votes in today's Senate, mm -hmm. but uh, she's going to be around for a while, and we're going to continue to hear from her. I don't believe she's going to run for president if Hillary runs, but uh, she's got the makings of a strong public policy a leader for many years to come. Yeah, I'm glad to see the Washington Examiner the head of the action. What if she runs? And that was done about a week ago. Yeah, in now, advance of I, I don't think she will run if uh, Hillary Clinton indicates right. she's going to run. I think that there's an agreement that mm nobody will get in the way of, of you want to make a bet on that secretary clinton mm -hmm. yes i i would bet i, I that think that's she would hurt herself if she ran she against she'd be ostracized yeah. well her. we're talking now uh, two years before the event well yeah. i'm talking i'm talking right? two years from now you don't she'd think make, make you don't think she runs against hillary right. if hillary drops she, out she'll she's get been in. giving she's she's going around she would be splitting the right. giving the interviews on the book all over the country you understand she's going to raise her profile she raise her profile and not run there's elizabeth warren destined to be a major player in American politics in the years to come, yes or no? Uh, she's, her profile is going to be raised, but a major player, yeah. no. She's going to do like Colin Powell. She's going to sell a lot of books, but she, in the end, she's not going to run for president. I agree with that. I don't think she's going to be uh, go beyond where she is right now, unless she's appointed to something in a Democratic administration after no, 2016. Major That's very no, possible. I think she'll be a major player. Not a major, major player, like okay, but she's certainly going to have a higher profile no, no. and right. deserves it. Right. She's a very intelligent woman mm -hmm. dealing with a lot of issues that I think affect a lot of people. This particular recommendation that she has, however, is going to cost billions of dollars every year. It's not just one year. It's going to cost billions of dollars every year at a time when we can't afford and it. That's it, a big and problem. And it also does nothing to underscore well, the underlying problem yeah. with higher education, which is, you know, the rising tuition costs and kids are leaving college and can't find work and they're not paying no. off these loans no Excuse matter me, what the interest cost so, billions so, to the banks, so, but the billions should be paid by people who've got overpriced no, student loans. That nine, doesn't nine make sense. Nine percent of students, students, tuition nine percent is, is of students default on their loans right. within two years. Very and the topic, too. It gets and look, it's they, a lot of money to we, be we losing, right, that. Mort? Issue four. Tease the ones you love. Here's the attitude. <laughs> oh, don't make me do this. Oh, this is too hard. You tease the ones you love, right? But some people misunderstood uh, what I had to say, and I wanted to make sure the members understood that the biggest impediment we have in the moving immigration reform is that the American people don't trust the president to enforce or implement the law uh, that uh, that we may or may not pass. Every year, Two weeks ago, in an appearance before a Rotary Club, House Speaker John Boehner mocked fellow Republican it. representatives who are reluctant to pass a comprehensive immigration overhaul. Later, Speaker Boehner appeared before the House Republican caucus and behind closed doors reiterated a key point he made earlier in the year. Namely, President Obama enforces the nation's laws selectively. From the Affordable Care Act to the Justice Department's latest proposal to free federal inmates convicted of unlawful possession of firearms before their sentences are complete. All of this is selective enforcement, and it has undermined confidence that the president will enforce new immigration laws. Notably, employer verification of job applicants' immigration status and enforcement of security along our borders. November's midterm election is six months from now, with 435 House seats in play. What role is this election playing in the timing of the House immigration debate? Bear in mind, the Senate passed its immigration overhaul nearly one year ago. Susan Ferecchio. Well, it's interesting that there's even discussion of immigration reform. Usually in an election year, forget it. That's too big an issue. They'll just hold off. The, the um, feeling amongst many Republicans in the House, because it all rests on the House, as you say, is that let's wait until we potentially gain control of the Senate. They're about six seats away. The polls look good for them. Why do it now when it would be politically dangerous for them, potentially? So that's the overwhelming feeling. And I think uh, John Boehner, the Speaker, is getting a lot of question, uh, pressure from the Chamber of Commerce and business groups to do something. The video where you showed him sort of mocking his rank and file is sort of a banner caught in the middle. They want to do something. They may get a border security thing over the, over the finish line this year, but it's, it's really tough in election year. They'll get a lot of More. resistance. Well, I mean, I think we know there's a huge vote that is at stake here, and it's primarily the Hispanic uh, vote, and everybody's worried about how that's going to play out, including the Republicans who are going 
to face a lot of them during the election. But the, well, real, the, the real vote that's a problem for Boehner and McCarthy yeah, is if they move ahead with immigration reforms, the leadership, they will cease to be the leadership. Well, Boehner yes. may be looking at the end of his speakership uh, regardless. There could be a coup, a coup from the right. Yeah, I agree. But I think there are two still two slender chances left. Mm -hmm. Once the primary season is over, yep. uh, you could have a vote before August. Kathy McMorris Rogers, yeah. the highest ranking woman yeah. on the Republican side, yeah. said she expected a vote. The right, of course, immediately mm -hmm. jumped on her and then in a lame duck session uh. when people in a sense have less to lose well, it, it could happen so I it's not dead yet <laughs> let's not overlook the possibility that the Senate may change hands well but then you November. have to they <laughs> okay Hillary's view in April last month Nova a 19 year old undocumented immigrant from Croatia choked up when she asked Hillary Clinton about a path to citizenship what do we need to do to put this in priority when it comes to Congress. Uh, I'm a huge supporter of immigration reform and a path to citizenship and you know we'll continue to advocate for that. Question, will immigration reform have to wait until the next presidency, two and a half years away? I ask you again, uh, Susan. Well, that's an interesting question. I think if Republicans take control of the Senate, there may be an opportunity there for Republicans to try to control uh, what the bill looks like uh, rather than waiting for yet another potential Democratic president. They may feel they're in better position to do this uh, in the next year. So I don't think it necessarily has to do that. I kind of get the feeling that it's talked about so much, it's bubbled up so many times that we might see it sooner than that. But I think at the very latest, uh, after a 2016 election, well, Jeb you would Bush. Uh, it would be a Jeb Bush. These things take a lot of time. Sometimes <laughs> yeah. it comes around and around. It takes right. several yeah. terms. If for the it. GOP takes over the Senate, uh -huh. it won't have to wait for two and a half years. I don't <laughs> think so. I think that they'll feel like, look, we can control what's in there a lot yeah. better. Predictions, Pat. Cameron's Tor Tory party will run third in the parliamentary elections in Europe. Hello. The real scandal is the backup in care at the VA, and the White House is going to urgently intervene. Susan. Finally. Oh, that's good. Uh, do you think Shinseki will resign? Quickly. No. You got a prediction? Yes, I do. I think Democrats will participate in the, Demo in the uh, Benghazi Select Committee. Mark. I think the uh, negotiations with the nuclear weapons ca capability on Iran is going to become a huge political issue in this country. The U.S. housing market, which has been flat now for months, will not make a full recovery from the bursting of the bubble until 2019, five years from now, and 10 years after the peak of the economic crisis. Joyful, loving Mother's Day weekend to you all. Bye-bye. <laughs>